So yeah, I, I think most of you uh, um, probably don't know the theme for today, so it might sound a bit scary, but it's actually a very positive theme. It's on um, suffering, but suffering as a cause for happiness. So often, you know, we, we kind of feel like suffering is a very loaded or heavy word, but according to the Buddha's teachings, this is actually the beginning of the path, when we have some kind of appreciation for the fact that life isn't always the way we might wish it would be, you know, and things don't go according to plan. You know, even if we're, we've got everything we want in life, sometimes that, that's the most difficult, because there's still this sense of something missing. And I had this for myself in my teens. I had pretty much, you know, a nice childhood, a comfortable house, family, good at school. Everything was kind of quite idyllic in a way and uh, very easy going. But then when I hit my teens, there was this huge question that surfaced for me about why I'm here, first of all. But then also a sense of the suffering of life, and not just my own life, but the life of people all over the world. You know, you only have to turn the news on to see you know, stories of wars and, you know, terrorist attacks and corrupt politicians, greed and all these, you know, qualities or lack of qualities of the heart that, you know, are prevalent in the human mind to realise that, you know, there is suffering, this is a reality. And the question for me was, what is the meaning of that? You know, why do we suffer? And is there a purpose in that suffering? Or is there something wrong with me, perhaps, you know? And that was quite a common question people used to say, well, what's wrong with you? You've got everything you need. Like, why are you suffering? And of course, that made the whole thing so much worse. <laughs> so for me, the, the kind of beginnings of confidence in the Buddha's teachings came through suffering, because when I heard him describe, you know, experience as consisting of some happiness, but also suffering, and he talked about there being a cause for suffering, I had such an enormous sense of relief, you know, because the first thing I realised was, okay, it's not that there's something wrong with me. You know, I mean, still, I get trapped in that thought that maybe there's something wrong with me. And I remember maybe five years ago, I was in uh, Australia, and I was having a hard time. It was the Rains Retreat, and um, I was in my kuti. And it's just like when Ajahn Chah sometimes says, you know, you can't go forward, you can't go back, you can't sit down, you can't stand still. Nothing would work. I didn't want to read, I didn't want to sit. I walked out on my walking path and I'm like, ah, oh, I can't stand this. I just felt like I need to burst out of this place, you know, beyond the valley hills. And, and I found my teacher and I said, ah, oh, I'm having, you know, this, this feeling and uh, being really sick. I said, what's wrong with me? And he gave me the most wonderful answer. <laughs> he said, the only thing that's wrong with you is that you think there's something wrong with you. <laughs> And I just found that so lovely and such a relief, you know. And sometimes that's all it takes, just to feel met and held and to be told, yeah, this is okay, this is actually what you can expect from life, yeah. Ajahn Chah has this wonderful phrase, he, he has a, there's a photo of him, um, my teacher keeps it in his cootie, and Ajahn Chah's got his arms up like this, and he's going, joy at last, to know there's no happiness in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a lovely message? You know, I, I think you all get it because you're laughing. <laughs> but that means that, you know, okay, there's nothing wrong with me. This is how it's meant to be. Perhaps the only thing that is wrong is that we expected it to be different, you know, or that we were looking for happiness in the wrong place. Yeah. So the Buddha teaches the Four Noble Truths to point out where we're suffering. You know, he's saying, okay, birth is suffering. Now, what is it? Jati Bidukha, Jara, old age is suffering. Maranam, death is suffering. Okay, so these are the physical sufferings that we, none of us can escape. I mean, we're born, I think, otherwise, unless any ghosts have turned up. Uh, <laughs> and therefore, we're aging every moment. It's not just a matter of old age, it's a matter of each moment. The body, once it reaches about 30 or maybe less, it starts to deteriorate, and there's nothing we can do about that. The best of, you know, yoga teachers or people who eat the best diets, the newest crazes, all the green juices, whatever, and they still get sick. So there's no way you can avoid that, you know. But there are ways you can change your attitude towards it, right? So this is going a bit ahead, but, but the death, the death is certain, right? And how are we going to face that death when it comes? You know, and what do sensual pleasures really matter when you face the death? So there's this other really lovely story um, that my teacher's fond of telling, and it comes from... Uh, I don't know if it comes from a text or a later text. It must be a later text than the suttas. 
Um, and it's the story of the Emperor Ashoka, who was uh, a great king in India. At first he was known as Ashoka the Cruel because he um, it was a very fierce leader, and I think, you know, like in many countries, but especially perhaps in those times, it wasn't very regulated. There weren't sort of, there wasn't the UN Court of Human Rights or whatever. <laughs> so people could get away with what they wanted. But then he came in contact with the Buddhist teachings and completely transformed his character. And he became known as Ashoka the Great. And so he's known for establishing all these wonderful pillars, Ashokan pillars, which are engraved with a very old script called Brahmi, which is one of the earliest um, written texts, actually, with uh, the Buddhist teachings, you know, embedded in those uh, pillars. You can still see them today in India. And he was known to be a very compassionate person, and he um, relieved people from taxes if they couldn't afford them, and this kind of thing, looked after the poor, um, looked after the animals, which wasn't very common in those days. And he had a brother who wasn't very uh, interested in the Dhamma, and wasn't very well established. And uh, he knew that his brother had a bit of envy, you know, towards Ashoka for having the throne, and his brother wanted the throne. <coughs> same old, same old greed, jealousy, you know, envy, ignorance <laughs> about where our happiness lies. And so one day he was having a bath in a bath, I guess it's like a public bath place, you know, with a sauna maybe in a spa. And, uh, and his cloaks and regalia was outside. And, uh, and he'd actually set this up so that his brother would walk past and feel a little bit tempted by these, uh, by these cloaks, you know, the royal, whatever you call it, <laughs> cloaks and gowns and crowns and all the rest. Um, and the attendant who was with his brother said, you know, why don't you try it on? I mean, you might become king soon. Try it on, go on. He said, oh, no, 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 it's a capital offence, you know, for someone who's not the king to try on the religious, the, what do you call it, regalia, royal regalia, whatever. And, uh, and he said, no, no, go on, you know, he's in the bath, nobody will know. And of course, you know, stories go, <laughs> just as he tried it on, King Ashoka came out of the bathhouse and caught him and said, oh, this is a capital offence. You know, what are you doing, brother? You know, you know this. And just because you're my brother, I can't spare you. You know, I, I can't help you now. But because you're my brother, I'll make one clause in the, in the sentence. He said, OK, for a week. Why don't you... Um, I'll put it off for a week, and in that time you can come into my palace and you can enjoy all the music and the... I don't know how many courtesans they had in those days and all the palace grounds and food. And you can enjoy that all for, for the next week, you know, but after that, I'm sorry, you know, you'll be beheaded. And so his brother had all that, which he'd been dreaming of and longing for and feeling envious of. And do you think he could enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> so then his brother Ashoka came to him after a week and said, so did you, did you enjoy it? He said, how could I enjoy it when I knew that death was awaiting me? <laughs> how could I enjoy any of that? And so the Emperor Ashoka had uh, taught him the lesson he wanted to, and he said, you know, brother, it, it was all a set-up. You're not really going to be beheaded, you know, but now perhaps you might have a different attitude. And of course, from there on, the brother became interested in the Dhamma. So, you know, the Buddha never said that there aren't any... There is no gratification in sensual pleasure, you know. There's nothing wrong in uh, enjoying good food, good company. Of course, if it goes into things which, uh, you know, dull the mind, like intoxicants, then we're on a kind of downward spiral because we become dependent and even addicted to that. But, um, you know, he's not condemning that. But what he did so very clearly was not to pursue those things because they're limited, they're transitory, and ultimately binding, yeah. The more we become dependent on these things, the, the more, in a sense, we're actually running away from that suffering. And if you look at the suffering as a causal link in the chain towards freedom, which it is in a particular sutta that we'll go into this afternoon, then suffering is a very precious place to be. Another thing my teacher sometimes says, because he talks a lot about the bliss of meditation, he said, well, don't worry about that. I mean, if you haven't got the bliss le yet, at least you've got the suffering. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got two parts of the Four Noble Truths. You've got suffering and the cause of suffering. So this is a place where the investigation can begin, right? Another thing I think which we can experience in our daily life about the way suffering can be a cause for happiness is through developing a much deeper empathy for others. 
I mean, sometimes things happen to us in life that we never expected. Maybe we've had quite a healthy upbringing and then one day somebody abuses us seriously. And, you know, and it shapes your whole world. This happened to me, so I know how it feels. It was like the ground was taken from under me and suddenly the world was no longer safe. And I hadn't had experience of this, and so it was really a big shock. And, uh, and I realised that a slight part of my mind in the past had been thinking, why do people stay in abusive relationships? You know, why don't they realise? I'm sure that I would never allow any abuse. I'd walk straight out. But when this happened to me, I realised, no, I was willing to give this person, who was a female friend, actually, another chance because we'd been through so much together. You know, it's like, I know where she's coming from. I know she's had a hard life. I know she's had a history, you know, that could make me empathise with why that might be and she didn't mean to do it, so let me give her another chance, you know, and I did that and it happened again, you know. And so I didn't really understand how it was to be in that position until it happened to me and, and since, now, since then I've developed a lot more compassion and empathy to others in that situation. So I consider that, mm, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say it's a blessing but it's certainly something that if I learn from it, if I sort of, so to speak, dig it in, dig in the muck, you know, you can call it the, uh, what do they call it, in uh, grist for the mill or whatever. There's another nice phrase from the north, um, where there's muck, there's brass. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say it in a northern accent. It basically <laughs> means where there's muck, well, dirt. There's a, I think it came from Sheffield, where there was, uh, you put in the hard work in the coal industry and then you got some money from that, you know, that was a big industry. But you can see it as the brass being like a spiritual brass as well, like the spiritual wealth that can develop. And so these things can be turned to your benefit and to the benefit of others if we allow that suffering to be fully met, fully felt and transform the heart, you know, and also to realise, I think this is really important, to realise that this is not unique to our situation, this is the human condition. We've, been, we've taken birth into this world and we're subject to the vicissitudes of life, whatever they happen to be. You know, and to me it's just an extraordinarily positive message to hear that there's a meaning for that. There's a meaning and there's also a way out. You know, the Buddha could identify the causes of suffering and say, you know, this is the prescription out. I mean, just recently I had some tests done <coughs> for a condition that I've been having for about 12 years since living many, many years in Asia and then ordaining in Burma in 2006. So this was after 10 years of already living in India um, and getting at least a couple of parasite infections every year, taking all the antibiotics, being too poor to take the probiotics and, uh, you know, just gradually worsening the <coughs> condition. So in Burma I got even sicker and um, I just thought, oh yeah, you know, once I finished my however many years of getting enlightened, I'll, I'll cure my sickness, no problem. <laughs> and my teacher also said, once you reach a certain stage, you'll probably cure the disease. So, oh, never mind, who cares? I'm equanimous, you know? <laughs> so I was, this is called the conceit of youth also, the conceit of, youth, <laughs> the conceit of health, <laughs> right? Because it didn't get better and it hasn't got better. Um, but just recently, I found a specialist in London and my charity who support me, because I'm trying to establish a monastery over here, um, they basically said, wonderful, you know, we're prepared to, like, fork out for those costs because it's, you need to be healthy. And so I went to the clinic and uh, just hearing the clinician describe what she thought was happening and why was such a relief. I can't tell you. I was like, I, have, I had, like, waves of happiness in my body for the next week. And this was before I even had a diagnosis. So I consider this something similar to when I first heard about suffering. It's like... You know you're suffering, but nobody's sort of admitting it, and you can't quite admit it to yourself. And when somebody actually says, yes, you are, it's like, oh, thank goodness, such a relief. You know, uh, it's like, oh, now, because as soon as you know you're suffering, that implies that there's something beyond that, there's something that's less suffering, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be a disease. So as soon as I heard, you know, what was going on with me and that there could be a cure, even before taking the medicine, there was some relief. Yeah, and now I've got a much fuller diagnosis, which is, you know, akin to the cause of suffering, right? The causes, that's the second noble truth. And the relief is even greater. And so the Buddha pointed us to these truths of suffering and the cause to kind of activate a wish in us to do something about that. But he wasn't so cruel as to say, well, you're suffering, tough luck. 
he actually <laughs> gave you the prescription. Okay? And the prescription is, as most of you might know, um, letting go of wanting in brief. Right? Letting go of wanting. Yeah? So he defines suffering as not only birth, death, ageing, and all that, but also the mental aspect of uh, sorrow, lamentation, grief, pain, and despair. And also the kind of, like, I suppose, relational um, suffering, which is being associated with those you don't wish to be associated with, which happens all the time. That's probably why a lot of you come here today, because you want to be associated with people who are on a similar path, right? So separation from the liked is suffering. Association with the disliked is suffering. And I don't think the Buddha was only talking about people. He was also talking about being separated from the experience that you'd like to have is suffering. You know, being separated from the good meditation that you had 20 years ago is suffering. How many of us have been trying to get that one back and failing? Because you're wanting something, right? <laughs> and then, yeah, separation from the liked and then association with the disliked. And then he says that tampicham uh, nalabati uh, tampidukam, it means um, not getting what one wishes is suffering. So there we're getting a clue as to what might be the way out, right? Is it through wishing, more wishes, what's called the affinity of wishes, or is it through learning contentment, the opposite of wishing, the opposite of wanting something different, wanting to be somewhere that you're not, yeah? Ajahn Brahm has a lovely phrase which kind of concisely brings all that together. It's, uh, he says, suffering is uh, the gap between where you are and where you want to be. <laughs> so, this is where you are, this is where you want to be. Or like this, maybe, or however you visualise it. <laughs> so, what's the solution? Do you just keep on striving, 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 here I am, ah, I want to get there. That's the space, and if you put wanting in that space, that's the second noble truth. So he calls that second noble truth meditation. You sit on your cushion, you want to be here, and you're like putting forth energy and effort. He says, actually, you think it's effort, but often it's just wanting. All that effort you're making on your cushion. Is it really coming from the right place? You know, is it just coming from wanting to be somewhere that you're not? So you can either do that and try to aim for that imaginary place, which you don't even know what it really is, or you can bring that right back down. So that's called lowering one's expectations. <laughs> Joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world. So lowering <laughs> expectations. <laughs> to right where we are. So this is about learning to be more fully where we already are. I really love that little kind of catchphrase. Be more fully where you already are. That's the whole thing. So then it's just about learning how. right? And so there's kind of three responses we can have to suffering. The first one is quite uh, common, and we, we all do all of these. <laughs> the first one is uh, using willpower, right, to get rid of or to change or to fight against what's happening within ourselves right now. So that's the kind of hard state of mind where we're resisting, you know, we're wishing it be different, we're separated from what we want. And, uh, and we, we think, yeah, through, through ego, through even just applying the teachings, we can get what we want. We're not having a very nice feeling right now. We sit to meditate, we feel a bit better. Fine, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're striving for that and using willpower, then you are separated from what you want, and it's going in the wrong direction. Sometimes it might work, but the danger with willpower is that if you do get the results you're after, there's a very strong sense of, I did it. And that builds ego. It builds a sense of self, right? And what the Buddha's talking about in this causal sequence, which we'll go into after lunch, is a causal sequence from suffering all the way to enlightenment. Right? Throughout that causal sequence, it says that no volition need be exerted. If this cause is there, then this is going to be the result. Then this is going to be the result. One cause leads to the next cause. It's a causal pro progress process. Yeah? So it's not dependent on a self or an I. It's actually dependent on putting that down for a while and just developing a lot of contentment, right? So this is one thing, and this is the kind of um, hard state of mind where we're sitting in meditation and it's like, I don't want this, this is really bad, this shouldn't be happening, this is painful, I don't want it to be painful, right? It's kind of resisting and struggling. So maybe anger's coming up, and then you become angry because you're angry. <laughs> 
or some other things coming up and you feel guilty because of that. That's really what you call double dukkha. <laughs> dukkha means suffering. That means doubling your suffering. You've already got your anger, and then you add anger into that. That's just adding flames or fuel to the fire, right? In India, they've got this um, thing called roti. It's like a flatbread. And do you know what they call bread? It's really nice. They call it double roti. Because <laughs> bread, bread is risen. <laughs> so I always think of that as like roti is like dukkha, and then double roti is like the bread that's risen. So the anger is like the yeast for the bread. <laughs> so this is called wrong attitude, wrong intention. So this is the opposite of uh, making peace. There's another nice simile that's called uh, the simile of the uh, anger eating demon, and this is from the uh, Samyutta Nikaya about this demon that came into an emperor's palace. And the emperor said, Get out of here, you don't belong here. And every time he was told this, this demon became bigger and bigger and bigger because he was feeding on the anger thrown to him. You know? It has to be a male, of course. It could have been a female or a, or a non binary person also. But in this particular case, yes, the demon was eating the anger and getting bigger and bigger. And eventually, um, somebody wise had the idea that maybe that's not the way. Maybe we should do the opposite and actually welcome this demon into the palace and say, oh, okay, you know. So you've come to the palace. Very nice to see you here, you know. Would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a foot massage? What can I do to make you welcome, you know? And this is what we call opening the door of the heart to whatever arises. So actually, even these demons of anger, jealousy, whatever it is, just <coughs> sheer boredom and frustration, they're little demons that want a bit of TLC. They just want to be recognised, noticed and cared for, you know? And so this starts to shrink the monster. And then you've only got the monster, but you've not got the big reaction to that monster. So this is you know, how we can start to overcome these problems. And then the second uh, way we can respond to suffering, the same suffering, is through wisdom power, which means investigation. Right? So rather than using willpower to overcome the problem, we use investigation, we use wisdom to understand the problem. So this is the first noble truth. The Buddha says there is suffering, and suffering is to be understood. Right? Not just suffering is to be overcome. I mean, sure, that's the goal, and that's the outcome, but the first step is suffering must be understood. And if you break that down further, in order to understand something, you have to meet it. Right? You have to come in contact with it, first of all. So then the question is, like, how do we come in contact with that suffering? Yeah, because sometimes it's really difficult and our minds go into that automatic response which is to react, to push away. Even if it's not as strong as that, it can be just like a slight tensing up towards it. Like you feel like, oh, you know, the meditation's here and it's like there's something that's not at ease with that. You know, you're building suffering. And so how do we actually meet it? And that is about the, the right intentions, yeah? So this is the second factor with the Noble Eightfold Path. It's the three right intentions of... Does anyone know the right intention? <laughs> speech. Uh, it's before speech, actually. It's before speech, yeah. The right intentions are what underlie the sealer, basically. So from right intention comes right speech, right action, right livelihood. But the right intentions are... Um, the first one is renunciation. And that's such a loaded word in this country. People also think, oh, monastics, I'm not sure about them. You know, they've renounced. What does that mean? They're all dried up and sort of stiff. <coughs> but I'm not really. I'm quite soft. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, renunciation, the other way of looking at, at that, can mean, uh, can be like letting go of ownership, yeah? non-ownership. So these things come up and it's like, okay, this has come, but it's not mine. I don't have to own it. I don't have to grab onto it and say, this is my problem, like... You know, you don't have to start identifying with these things. Yeah? And another way to think of renunciation is a kind of letting go, rather than grasping. Yeah? Upadana is like a grasping, a holding on. You let go, put it down for a bit. So yeah, this is here, but I don't have to like, pick it up, make it my problem. And then the second one is avyapada, which means uh, non-ill will. But often in the Pali Canon, um, the Buddha uses negatives to imply positive things. And so that is actually a synonym for metta which is loving-kindness. Yeah? <coughs> so first it's the non-ownership, second it's the loving-kindness, and that's the welcome to my palace. Ogre, you're welcome. You know? This is the loving-kindness. This is saying, okay, come in, sit down, have a cup of tea, 
let me see how I can serve you. My teacher always says that when I phone him, not have a cup of tea because he's in Perth, but he says, how can I be of service? Which is so sweet. Sometimes I just want to complain. But, you know, that's okay too. That's the service, isn't it? He's <laughs> in my dustbin at that moment. <laughs> yeah, so the metta is really key. And that should underwrite everything. The whole motivation for why you come to practice. Yeah, It's to learn to be kind, to learn to have loving kindness. Out of compassion for oneself and others. Yeah, This is the highest purpose of practice. Rather than coming because there's something wrong with me and I need to change it and I don't like myself, you know. I mean, of course we bring that, but that also needs love and kindness. Yeah. So, and then the third one is uh, avihimsaka or vihimsaka, which is uh, like non-harming. And I think that's a synonym for compassion because harming or cruelty is the uh, opposite of compassion. So, so these three, letting go, metta, loving kindness and compassion are the right motivations to practice. And so we bring these things, we bring these attitudes to whatever we experience. And when you bring something into that kind of field of loving kindness, it tends to stay. So when you meet your suffering with compassion, you can see it, you have a chance to actually see it. You're not just saying, ooh, I don't like this, and I haven't even noticed it, maybe not that bad, but ooh, I don't want to look. You know, having compassion towards it means that it, it, you're able to keep it there, but it wants to stay with you because you're quite a nice person to be with. It's not intimidated. And when it's not intimidated, it often becomes very... It loses all its energy, it loses its power over you, and it just dissolves quite quickly. Yeah. But this is a tricky bit, because you don't give it love so that it dissolves. <laughs> right? That's how the mind starts to bargain. It's like, OK, I'll use compassion as long as you change into something more pleasant. That's not, <laughs> that's not the thing. But that's okay too. If that happens, you have to give that compassion too, right? <laughs> it's like if you react to anger with anger, you have to give the reacting to anger with anger <coughs> compassion. <laughs> it's actually one of the best solutions and, um, and contentment too, right? being, being at peace with where you are. <coughs> that's another kind of compassion. And I think along with that compassion is gentleness and patience. Right? Because we can't, we don't know how long something arises for and when it's going to cease. Ajahn Chah apparently had a very interesting method. He said, right, get angry, put a clock in front of yourself and see how long you can stay angry. <laughs> 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 he was quite a tricky one, <laughs> funny one. <laughs> so, you know, the point is that it, it does pass, right? But it certainly doesn't sort of stick and cause so much harm and devastation in the mind if we don't cling on to it and make it mean something about me, that poor defiled little me. Yeah? So it's that not making these things mean more than they are and um, treating them with kindness and compassion. So that's the second kind of response. So you can think of love as a kind of balm that soothes the suffering mind. And then the third one is a bit challenging, but I felt like bringing this up today because it's not so much a response to the suffering, but it's just a deeper understanding of it. So the first two are more involved with, like, in a way, transforming the suffering into something, uh, into wisdom to a certain degree, but kind of still operating in the realm of the world and, and feeling that we can improve our lot in the world, right? The third one looks more at the case of where the Buddha defines suffering as basically being born and having these, what he calls, five components of existence, right? Now, there's a common misunderstanding about this amongst people because these components of existence are called the components subject to attachment, right? Because, basically, having these things, we're bound to attach. But some people translate that as attachment to these things, and if we're not attached to them, then there's no suffering. But that's actually not what it means, right? So these five components of existence, for anyone who isn't aware, are the body, or the rupa kanda, it's called the component of physical matter, right? So we all have a body, something physical. Then the next four pertain to the mental realm, right? So that's the realm of feeling, which is interesting, because sometimes we think of feeling as physical, but it's actually how the mind experiences what's felt, or what's felt mentally or physically. Right, so that's feeling, and that's an attribute of the mind, an aspect of the mind. The next one is um, like sankara, which means kind of volition or will, or it can also mean a kind of a reaction to that feeling. Yeah? 
a kind of reaction. So it's the bit that says, oh, I don't really like this, or oh, I want more of this, or let me do something about this. So Sankara is very much aligned with this will, as we spoke before, the willpower. And it's, again, quite a natural response, because we're living beings, we have this response. The next one is perception, so we perceive, right? Because we're alive, we perceive. I'm perceiving all of you in the room, I'm perceiving like the light on the ceiling, or this beautiful flowers that somebody put here, right? You could say that I'm perceiving the flowers and my I like it is the sankara, right? I perceive the flowers, actually what happens next is I get a pleasant feeling. Because of the pleasant feeling, I say, oh, I want some of those flowers, you know, and I, well, maybe I can get to take them back with me, or something like that, that's the sankara, yeah? And then the last one, is that all of them? Is that four? The last one is consciousness. So simply being cognizing, simply cognizing, right? And the Buddha's saying that all of these, not conduce to suffering, but are suffering. Simply having any experience, being born, existing, is in itself suffering. And this is what can be described as exist existential suffering, just the sheer suffering that's involved in, in life, right? That we can't escape from, or at least we don't think we can. So we're always looking to kind of fix this. And I think when you kind of... <coughs> I mean, obviously one of the things that leads towards the spiritual search in the case of the Buddha and also in the case of myself was kind of going through all the possibilities for life in my mind and thinking, well, I could do this and it would end up like this or I could do that if I had a family or if I had this kind of job. And I looked at all of it and I thought, I don't really understand the point of it and all of it is going to end because basically, you know, people die. People die, you know, if I have a house and I'm working really hard to maintain that house and that keeps me kind of enslaved in work and in a job and, and I just couldn't really see a way out. And I thought, okay, well, that's fine, but there must be something more. There must be something else, another kind of happiness. And I think this is where the, the spiritual search really begins because we stop looking for that happiness unrealistically in the world and we start to realise that the answer may lie beyond the realm of the senses, right? So there can be another happiness which doesn't pertain to this sensual world. And there's another really beautiful sutta in the... Uh, I mean, it's all throughout the suttas, but the one I really like is called a sutta on non-conflict. And in this sutta, it's Majima 139, for anyone who's a sutta person. Um, I don't see any pens coming out. <laughs> in this one, the Buddha says... Um, that one of the principles of non-conflict is to know happiness and know how to define happiness. And knowing that, pursue one's own happiness within oneself. Right? So he's not saying, like, oh, there's no happiness, you know, it's not right to get happy, and you know, there's no way to get happy. What he's saying is that there's some kinds of happiness which are of the world, he calls them inferior, he calls them low, inferior, ennoble, not of the noble people, um, and they don't lead to enlightenment. But he's, he's admitting that that is a kind of pleasure, and that's the sensual pleasure, right? But he's saying that's not to be pursued. So again, it's not that this is wrong and that you can't have any sensual pleasure. I mean, I'm looking forward to the lunch that this very lovely lady cycled up the hill to bring me today, which was just really moving. She cycled all the way up the hill. I couldn't even cycle for two minutes up the hill. <laughs> and uh, just to deliver this meal that she cooked according to my uh, strange stomach. And now uh, she cycled back down the hill and gone to work or gone somewhere. And isn't that wonderful, you know? So I'm going to enjoy that, no problem. But the Buddha's saying we don't pursue that kind of happiness, right? Because it's limited and because it's not leading to the goal. So he's not making a value judgment. He's just saying that I'm concerned with your highest benefit. Your highest benefit is to get fully enlightened and to waken to another kind of happiness that is durable, that is lasting, that is beyond the realm of the senses, and that doesn't you know, let you down. And the other beautiful thing is it's not dependent on anyone else. It's, it's like a wellspring of happiness that arises from within you, from within your own pure mind. Right? He says that he doesn't see one thing more conducive to happiness than a well-trained mind. This is the real way to go. So there's the essential pleasure on the one side, but he's saying that that is one of the extremes of the middle way. I mean, it's not the middle way, it's one of the extremes. But the pleasure that he defines as part of the middle way, it's another definition of the middle way, is the pleasure that's secluded from the senses, the pleasure born of renunciation, seclusion, peace, 
and the bliss of enlightenment. And this actually is a, a description of the jhanas. So the jhanas are very deep states of stillness in the mind. So when the mind is very, very um, contented within itself, very, very still, and actually removed altogether from the sensory world. This is a very different kind of happiness that's something like born of the Brahma realm. So in Buddhism we have all this cosmology and there's different realms. So this is the beings of this is the realm of human beings, but there are realms of devas and brahmas and whatever you take that to mean, whether you think that's a physical place or whether that's just a place that we can come to in our mind, he's saying there is something else. And that is why he described the first kind of pleasure as inferior, inferior to this higher pleasure. Right? It's not a judgment, it's just a comparison. And so he's saying that kind of pleasure should not be feared and should be cultivated, should be repeatedly practised and pursued. Right? And he himself didn't you know, really understand that until very close to his enlightenment. Until then he was practising austerities, really severe austerities. And then one day he, he uh, was, I don't know, sitting or walking, I don't know, and he remembered an experience that he had as a child at about eight or seven or eight, sitting under a rose apple tree, and, uh, and his father was ploughing the fields, and at that time he felt very relaxed, very calm and peaceful, and he went into some kind of deep meditation, just spontaneously, without any instruction. Sometimes it's better, you know, without the instruction, because then the will and the sense of self doesn't get too involved. <laughs> Um, so this happened to him, he remembered that, and then he instinctively, intuitively felt, this is the way to Bodhi, this is the way to enlightenment, and this pleasure is not to be feared, because it's got nothing to do with the senses, it's not subject to cessation in the same way, it's not subject to the law of impermanence, you know, the laws of suffering and non-self, it's something else. Well, actually, it is subject to some of those things at a level, but not, it's still not final enlightenment, but... It's more sustaining, it's more fulfilling, and it's that kind of happiness that we're all looking for, you know, a real sense of deep contentment. And that's the kind of contentment that is within you, whatever life throws at you. I mean, even for me at the moment, I'm getting a sense of just the amount of joy you can get from serving. I mean, most of the time when people ask me how I am, I tell them I'm just exhausted, and I am. I mean, I hardly sleep. <laughs> as well as I should sleep, and uh, I've got a huge project. I spend sometimes 14 hours a day online. I mean, anyone who's stayed with me knows the pressures to some extent and all the things I'm juggling. And yet, at the same time, so many beautiful people come through my door, a few of you have been, and, uh, <laughs> and there's such a sense of reciprocal kindness and, and generosity and just sheer joy and delighting in each other's company. The fact that, you know, we're doing something here to establish... The Dhamma, it's very small, but it doesn't matter because it's all been built up out of donations and out of voluntary um, offerings. Nobody's being paid to do work for me. I'm not getting paid. <laughs> you know, and it, it's just incredible that in four years, starting from nothing, not even having a trust, we've actually got to the point where we've got a little base. And it's like a repository of kindness. It's really lovely. And everyone who comes in kind of adds their little contribution to that. And I'm starting to get a real sense of um, satisfaction and a kind of a wholesome happiness that's just in the background of everything I'm doing, you know, even if I am tired or whatever, however I feel frustrated or, oh, it's not fair. Like the little ego comes, oh, it's not fair. How can my teacher send me to do this all on my own? There's always more, more, more than one. <laughs> and there's always a lay person or an anagarika, oh, it's not fair. And that's the little ego on the surface, but deep down there's something else that's carrying me, and it's a sense of enormous gratitude to my teacher to be having this opportunity to serve, and just the joy that comes through service and living a virtuous life. You know, so what I want to say when I'm talking about this kind of subject of deep meditation is that the path of happiness starts long, long, long before you get into these states. <coughs> and we'll talk more about it after lunch, because I want to go through this causal sequence from suffering all the way to enlightenment in detail because that's more about the process of meditation. This is more like the big picture, right? So we'll get into that more, but between these two steps of like, suffering leads to confidence, confidence leads to joy, right? This is joy in the practice. Between these steps is the virtue, is the sealer, is the living a wholesome life, yeah, the inspiration. And this is really important because this is already a kind of wholesome joy that's available if we only notice it, right? There's lots of places in the suttas where the Buddha talks about uh, noticing it, 
I'll just read one because I can't resist and then we'll do some meditation. So I'll just read this one. Because we can do the wholesome deeds, but sometimes we just do it like, oh yeah, anyone would do it. I didn't really notice that it gave me any happiness. I mean, you know, that's just normal. Or somebody praises you and you say, oh no, no, it's nothing, it's nothing. I should have done more. You know, but take a moment. The Buddha says, take a moment to actually reflect on what you've done and to bring it up in your mind and to arouse joy. There's nothing wrong with that and it encourages more goodness. It's not egotistical because if you're happy and you're doing good, other people are going to benefit from that. Right? So this is how, I mean, you can use your own words, but this is the way it's talked about in the suttas, about how to reflect on one's <coughs> own goodness and virtue. <coughs> so he says, when a wise person is on a chair, on a bed, or resting on the ground, then the good actions they did in the past, their bodily, verbal, and mental conduct, cover them, overspread them, and envelop them. Just as the shadow of a great mountain peak in the evening covers, overspreads and envelops the earth, so too when a wise person is on a chair, on a bed or resting on the ground, then the good actions they did in the past, their bodily, verbal and mental conduct, cover them, overspread them and envelop them. Then the wise person thinks, I've not done what is evil, I've not done what is cruel, I've not done what is wicked. I've done what is good, what is wholesome, and I've made myself a shelter from anguish. Okay. Isn't that lovely? I think that's really lovely. So, so with that in mind, would you like to have a five minute break for the toilet or get, yeah, or get straight into the meditation? People are yeah, moving to the roof. Okay, so. Uh, we'll start the meditation in about 5-10 minutes and other people are welcome to just stay here and just yeah, settle. <laughs>